Good morning. It is truly a privilege to be here. Uh, I know I haven't met anyone here personally yet, but the atmosphere of glory, I always feel at home. Amen. Uh, it's been a long time coming for us to connect. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you uh, begin to listen to the Lord and uh, begin to invite me here and I'm glad the Lord speaks, <laughs> but I love you guys. Uh, I love what the Lord is doing here, amen. I love what the Lord is doing in the earth, and I'm just thankful that we can be a part of it. Hallelujah. I bring you greetings all the way from Dallas, Texas. My beautiful wife here, Jeanette, my better half. Go and wave at them. Let me see you. We... Um, yeah, we planted a church last night. Amen? And uh, we were excited to wake up early this morning. <laughs> and to just drive two hours to be with you. My body may not have been excited, but my, my spirit is. But, but really, we're always excited to get in the atmosphere of, of what God is doing. And, and if that means that we have to lose sleep, uh, so be it, because the hunger and the thirst for what God is doing far outweighs how much did I sleep. I've been too stirred to worry about sleeping anyhow. Anywhere where I know the Lord is moving, I'd rather just get up and go. Amen? So um, as I was praying, coming here, and I, I've been in a time of consecration for what the Lord has been doing at the beginning of the year, and um, praying about, Lord, what what is it that you... You want me to share with a, a congregation that is doing so much good things. Uh, and within the last year, and I'll, I'll kind of unfold this a little more, I began to realize I'm here on assignment. I mean, you should be on assignment when you go and minister, of course. But there is a particular assignment that the Lord has had me on continually. And sometimes when I go to minister, I'm always looking different places where you want a particular word for that region. Uh, it's okay if you, if you have a, a word that may expand for different places. That's, that's, that's all good. Uh, but one particular thing that I've been finding myself do in the last year was the Lord would send me a place to actually begin to come as a midwife to help push and birth what a region or a congregation is already pregnant with. Does, does that make sense? Um, I feel that thing dropping now. So um, I've been in, I've been in this, a long season of travail uh, where sometimes I just go places and I don't really minister. I just begin to release a sound of travail. Um, since 2009, uh, just to kind of give you where I'm, I'm going here, uh, we actually moved here from Pennsylvania eight years ago. So we're not we're not Texans. We, <laughs> but what did it, what did the uh, license plate say? I'm not. I wasn't born in Texas. If I got here fast as I could, right? Uh, that doesn't really apply to us. We didn't get here fast as we could. Uh, <laughs> we were in Pennsylvania and we were doing ministry there and. and and the Lord began to tell us that uh, we're, I'm sending you to Dallas because Dallas would be one of the platforms for revival in the nation. That what brought us to Dallas. We didn't know anybody. That was eight years ago. So a lot of so, but in 2009, we moved 2010, 2009. After coming out of this 21-day uh, fast, the Lord began to speak to me about inheritance and revival. And um, I remember we, my wife and I, were driving to. Uh, to a mall, small, small area. We're trying to drive through the town and run away to a mall. And I'm telling her all these things the Lord's saying. And uh, I'm driving. Luckily, I'm in a slow lane. And I start to just vibrate uncontrollably while I'm driving. And uh, uh, I kind of laugh because I remember the people that were driving next to us like, what is, what is he doing? I said, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so I, I pull over and and my wife drives, and I begin to vibrate for I don't know, a couple of hours straight. But out of that, 
I begin to have this travail in my belly since then. And every year the Lord began to bring much more articulation to it. Uh, two years ago, well, actually three years ago, long story short, the Lord began to shift my thinking and said, no longer begin to talk about revival coming, but realize that you carry it and you must give birth to it. So there's been an increase of travail to begin to give birth, not just to revival, but give birth to the glory that's on the inside of us. Uh, uh, Paul says in Colossians 1.27, it says, the mystery to the Gentiles is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And even as we were talking about hope and singing about hope this morning in worship, I felt that there is a hope and expectation of even a greater glory that the Lord wants to begin to birth out of this place. I began to see uh, Bob Jones years ago. He had, um, there was these dreams and visions that he had of Dole's Army. Everybody remember those? And, and I remember one particular, he, uh, there, were, there were people that were stationed before coming into stadiums and there was a banner that said Joel's Army, and people were coming in and listed. Anyone ever hear, hear that before? Um, well, as we were in worship, I've seen a similar vision. It didn't say Joel's Army, but there was an enlistment, and people in this region were coming in, and there were angels that had swords that were crossed, and it looked like the, you, it, was the, it was the angels that stood before the Garden of Eden. And they were coming in, and it says enlistment. But they were, these, those that are coming in, it's a great harvest. They weren't saved. But as they were coming in, they were coming into an army. And it was this place. And I've seen, I've seen a shaft of fire begin to shoot up out of this uh, roof. And it began to be a, 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 a calling card, if you will, for the glory is here. And people on 35 could begin to see it. And the Lord says, I'm raising up an army because a harvest is coming. There's a harvest coming. What's in you, my assignment is to come alongside you and help you begin to give birth to it. Then, Andy, I've seen the, the Lord kind of through these plans, and they begin to spread out here, and I begin to see these plans, and, and, and the Lord said expansion. There's expansion coming, but also uh, superimposed upon that were uh, it was a war room at the same time there are these strategies where this is the expansion but this is a strategic war plan it's going to help you to begin to advance amen because when they came into the promised land in, in, in Joshua they had to fight it says every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon shall be yours but you're going to have to fight for it amen there is a transition that we are in as a body, and what the Lord is doing here is part of that. We are transitioning into promise. But we're going to have to begin to advance for what the Lord promised us. Because the enemy does not want us to begin to grab hold of what is our inheritance. Hallelujah. So two years ago, I began to have this vision that the bride was giving birth. It was an open vision. It was just an inner vision. But when I came out of this inner vision, I could tangibly feel two things in my hand. So this is double portion, it's inheritance. Then the travail increased from there. So the hope and the expectation of the glory is also our inheritance. Does that make sense? It's us realizing and identifying with what we carry is sons and daughters of the Most High. We are, we are, we are kids of the King. Amen? So, who? There is a need for the harvest that is coming for you and I to be equipped and trained and ready to walk in the maturity of what we've been given as sons and daughters. Amen? And I believe the Lord is going to begin to, as we minister today, release a spirit of wisdom in Revelation. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a preacher's kid. I'm a, I'm a PK kid, so that's a whole other story. But the uh, <laughs> reason I mention that is when I first got into uh, ministry about 17 years ago, my dad said, "Just I want you just to begin to pray this prayer every day. And he said, begin to pray the prayer of Ephesians 1. 
at the end. And I didn't know what I was praying. I do now. I clearly didn't know then. But, but Paul says that, uh, that praying to the Father of glory, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the, to the Ephesian church, that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. And I love how the Amplified reads it. says, so that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with light. Yeah. <laughs> flooded with light. The light of the glory of the Father of glory. So, so that your eyes will be, be open and you will begin to know the hope. Somebody say hope. The hope of his calling. What does that mean? So that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with illumination of what is not just around you, but what is in you. Because before the Lord comes for his church, he's coming through his church. Before the Lord comes for his church, he's coming through his church. Hallelujah. We are called to be a witness of the resurrection of Christ. Tracks are good. I believe in those. He gives us the tracks out. Witnessing two people. Great. I love that too. But it didn't say two witnesses. It said be one. So when they see us, they don't see us. They see the life of the resurrected Jesus in and through us. That's what we're giving birth to. Christ in us. The hope and expectation of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when I begin to pray that prayer, I realize that the spirit of wisdom and revelation is what begins to unlock Christ in you. Wisdom begins to be the, the, the blueprint of what the Lord has for you to do, and revelation begins to unfold it. So it's not just revealing a revelation of who he is, but it's revealing Christ in you. It's like there's a veil that when the veil comes uh, off of who you are, you also begin to reveal Christ. Does that make sense? Um, so, th th so what is it? that the Lord needs for us to do in order for what's in us to get out? That's, that's really the question. Um, I believe the spirit and the power of Elijah is about to increase so that what's in us can begin to come out. Hey. Hey. I think it's an atmosphere I could be myself, right? Okay. You know, I was, hey. Some places I go to are like, what is he doing? I don't know. <laughs> Paul says this in Ephesians 3, verse 1 and 2. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If ye heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which was given to me, to you, that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote in a few words, thereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, another, in other ages was not made known, unto sons of men has now been revealed to holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Paul first says, I'm a slave of my assignment. I have a will, but my will is to do what you want me to do. I freely choose to be a slave of what I'm assigned to do. It has arrested me. He has captivated me I'm not, I'm not, it's one thing to be captive, but it's a whole other thing to be captive because you're captivated by who has you captive. That's a weapon. This is a weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God and the pulling down of strongholds and the casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. 
2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4, and verse 5, I believe. Uh, that word captive also can be captivated. So when we become captivated by the one we behold, we become captive by it. It's our assignment. So Paul says, I'm captive because of you heard of the dispensation of grace. Somebody say dispensation. That word dispensation also speaks of a, a steward over a house or a steward over a fiscal treasure. It's actually where it comes from, a house. Or, or, or Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 4 that me being a steward of the mysteries of Christ. It means he is a manager over the financial uh, treasure that's in the house. And the treasure that's in the house, the house is the, the house of God. But the treasure that is in is the mystery and the secret of the heart of God. Hallelujah. The word mystery is speaking of the secret heart and will of God is, is, ba is basically a, a plain definition of it. It's the, it's the heart of God and his, his will that he wants to make known to his people. That word in the Greek is synonymous with the word mystery when, when the prophet Amos says that God will do nothing in the earth to reveal his secrets to the servants, the prophets. It's not secrets that you're not supposed to know. It's what he reveals to those who have been captivated by him. Does that make sense? So Paul's saying, I want to begin to reveal to you out of my captivity, my hunger for God, what is made known to those who become captive by him too. The treasure that I pull out is not because you have a great degree. And I'm still in school. I'm getting my master's. But it's, that's not what brings the secret. There are secrets that are hidden in the heart of God that if you want to get his heart, you have to, if you want to get the secret, you have to go to his heart. So, so the word for secret uh, in, in, the, in the Hebrew actually means his divine counsel that he reveals to those who are intimate. When we learn to become captivated by him, he begins to reveal his heart. And when he reveals his heart, treasure begins to be poured out, which is his divine counsel. His divine counsel begins to bring us into the reality of what we carry. So if we want to begin to walk like him, the treasure is in, in his heart. Sometimes we make it too hard. Get in his heart. One of the greatest keys that I found was intimacy. And the key of intimacy began to cause an overflow of revelation. And revelation began to bring about cleansing, repentance, and demonstration. But it all flowed from a place of intimacy. There's a reason why we're called sons. There's a reason why we're called the bride. It's close proximity. Oh, yeah. Because if I'm, if I'm in love and captivated by the king of kings, you don't have to tell me to pray. I run to the prayer room. If I'm captivated by the king of kings, you don't have to tell me to read my word. I want to begin to love on him all day long. That wasn't even where I was going to go, so somebody must have needed that. <laughs> okay, so we're the house of God. And there is a treasure that's on the inside of us that needs to get out, right? Things that begin to unlock are keys. Keys in Scripture speak of authority, but also speaks of interpretation of Scripture. Because when you begin to follow the dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees, one thing he begins to say to them with about seven woes in between in Matthew 23 is, Woe to you who had the key of knowledge. But he says, But not only did you lock yourself out, but you locked out all those that followed you. Why? Because they would begin to combat with Jesus 
about interpretation of Scripture. So here comes John the Baptist prior to Jesus showing up on the scene, who moves in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Are you with me? Okay. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to read in the English Standard Version. Verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low, and the uneven ground become level, and rough places plain. Now check this. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So when you come into the Gospels, for example... Mark 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So Mark in his gospel, and also in Matthew and John, it begins to declare that John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, in fulfillment of Isaiah 40, preparing the way for the king. I was in prayer uh, sometime last year, and I began to see uh, I began to see the glory of God emanating off, off of Jesus. But there were all of these roadblocks that were in front of him. I was like, "What is all these roadblocks?" And he began to quote Isaiah 40 to me. Now, Isaiah is talking about a forerunner that would go before the king in those days. The forerunner was one that would go, because there was no I-35, there was, there was no uh, uh, 635, there was no highways. There was valleys, there was hills, there was crooked roads, there was, there was stones. And in order before the king and his army, catch this, came into the area, the forerunner would go before the king and begin to make every crooked road straight, every rough place smooth, fill in every valley, brought down every high place, so when the king and his army came, they had an easy straight path to come into the area. Are you with me? So, it says he's preparing the way of the Lord. Somebody say way. Way speaks of moral character. So when I seen this vision of these roadblocks, it says I'm locked up inside my people because their character can't handle the glory coming out. Are you with me so far? The reason Jesus had such a problem with the Pharisees is because they began to create their own commentary to try to interpret how the Lord was coming. And it began to become so far off that they caused their traditions to be lifted above Scripture. <laughs> See, the law would say, love your neighbor. The Pharisees would say, Hate your enemy. They would add. You're like, oh, that's just the Pharisees. No, we do the same thing. What is the principle? Because we don't know, because we've not been intimate enough to see the way of the Lord coming, we begin to interpret the way that we think that He should come. So, what that causes is the Pharisees were causing the people of God that had been waiting for the Messiah to come for up to 3,500 years. 
and they couldn't even recognize him when he was in the earth. So here comes John the Baptist in the spirit and power of Elijah that says, repent, turn, repent of your sins, shift the way that you see, let there be fruit of repentance so that you can recognize the king when he gets here. Come with me, I'm going somewhere. He said, prepare. Somebody say prepare. prepare. The word prepare in Isaiah 40, it, it's the singular form of presence. It's the word pana. And it means to turn back to the face. Woo. Turn back to Pianim or turn back to the face or the presence. So the spirit and power of Elijah was to turn a wicked generation who was looking at the wrong face. Looking at the wrong idols. We've created these faces, these idols. According to Isaiah 115, they have eyes they can't see. They have ears they can't hear. They have hands they can't handle. They have feet they can't walk. They have no breath. But those that make them become like them. The Pharisees were creating this image of how the Messiah ought to look. But when the real Messiah came, they couldn't recognize him because they were turned to the wrong face. So John the Baptist in the spirit and power of Elijah was to cause repentance and turn back to the face, the presence of God, so that we can begin to recognize the king when he comes. The spirit and power of Elijah, I believe, is already in the earth. But I believe is increasing this year in, in a way that he's never before. Because the kingdom is about to manifest in a way that we have not recognized. And if we don't begin to turn back to his face and make it presence driven and not sermon driven and not and not and not or our own ideas driven, we're not we're gonna miss what he's getting ready to do. Hallelujah. I don't want to miss anything that the Lord's done. I want everything that he has for us. Because the, the beautiful thing about it is the word face or word's presence, it's plural. So it means faces. <laughs> Does it mean God looks crazy, has more than one face? No, it's his character. There are different dimensions of his face that he's revealing to us. And if we don't learn to shift and begin to be aware and live and walk continually in his presence, we'll miss when he begins to shift and do something new. When you follow revival history, many times the old move becomes opposition to the new one. Because when God begins to reveal a new dimension of his face, we get stuck on what he's revealed and we're not ready for what's coming. There's more. There's more. <laughs> There's more. So here comes John the Baptist. It says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And Mark 1 is not just quoting Isaiah 40. It's also quoting Malachi 3. Malachi 3, 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. He... <laughs> oh... <laughs> Who 
can endure? The day of His coming. Who can stand when He appears? He is... Hey. Oh. He is like a refiner's fire and fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and He will purify the sons of Levi, and He will refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings of righteousness to the Lord. I believe the spirit and power of Elijah is coming like a refiner to introduce the refiner. He's coming like a refiner to prepare us to introduce the refiner. Jesus is the refiner. But Elijah still carries fire. Ah. What does that look like? Years ago, I was in ministry. I was ordained. Preaching Jesus, I was loving on Jesus, and I was having dreams and visions. Uh, this one particular year, I was having, I probably had, I don't have dreams as much as I did then, but this particular season, uh, I had, I dreamed almost every night. And then I came into this encounter where I woke up, and then I was in this temple. This, it was ancient. It was like everything was ancient. Everything you stepped on was, was uh, ancient. You can hear every step you took. It's like, uh, and and the and the doors were ancient. And I go into this room, and it's the longest room I've ever seen. And way at the end of the room, there is this being engulfed in fire, sitting up on a throne. And there's a few people in front of them. It's like they're having this intimate council meeting. When I walk into the room, the terror that was on my heart, I said, "That guy, that has to be the devil." And I must have went to hell. Because my grid could not connect that level of fear with Jesus. I said, I got to be Satan. And I'm like, Lord, what did I do? I'm, I'm living the best that I know how. How did I end up here? So then uh, I can't hear the language. All I can hear is fire. So I try to sneak out of the room. But then... Everything's ancient. So I take a step. It, it just vibrates. And, and they look. And I'm like, then the level of fear began to take off. It, it, it's, it's hard to describe in words. Um, but I tried to sneak out of the room and the door closed. And then when I look behind me, uh, he opens his mouth and this river of fire begins to come after me. And I'm really freaking out now. But then all of a sudden, it consumes me and I come out of this encounter and I can hear an audible conversation between two people but I don't know the language it took me about a half hour to realize that that wasn't Satan that was Jesus but I had no grid for when I actually encountered him so this became real alive to me we Many a time say we want the Lord. But can we handle him when he comes? Are we willing to allow his fire to consume everything? Even our own misunderstandings. So John the Baptist prepares the way. He's a messenger. And John, in the Gospel of John says, John, uh, the Gospel of John says, John the Baptist was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. His light was a manifestation or a picture of the one who sent him. Whew. The spirit and power of Elijah is to make every wrong mindset of how the kingdom is getting ready to manifest be made straight. 
It's a revelation that causes every high place that we lifted above the King of Kings to come down. It's caused every valley of hopelessness also to be lifted up. And every road that has caused us to go the wrong direction is being made straight. Every stone that's been in the way is being removed. Because he is making himself known through the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare us for a greater glory. When the king comes, he comes with his entourage. In the context of Isaiah 40, the preparation is being made to come out of Babylon and into Jerusalem. So the spirit and power of Elijah is coming to bring us out of a mixture Babylonian system and to make a highway to bring us in to the reality of the kingdom. The Babylonian system, and also Egypt, many times is described as a dragon or Leviathan. <laughs> like Isaiah 45, says, the anointing of Cyrus comes to begin to pull God's people. It says they're double doors, right? Well, you read that in Isaiah 45 and you compare it to Job. Those double doors are jaws. And the system that has tried to devour God's people, one of the ways he's pulling them out is the spirit and power of Elijah. They begin to open up the jaws of Leviathan and begin to pull his people out. <sighs> the enemy has devoured his people for too long. Oh! We don't know our inheritance because we're too busy, too busy being consumed. And when we're being consumed by the plots of the enemy, we begin to lose hope. And when we lose hope, we lose, we lose fire. We become apathetic. We become dry. Because we can't hope. We can't see. Hallelujah. But he's restoring hope. Because Christ in you is the hope of glory. One thing that comes with glory is hope. Hope that you're going to be healed. Hope that you're going to be delivered. Hope that you're going to be set free. Hope that you will be the head and not the tail. Hope that you will live above and not under. Hallelujah. Hope that what God has promised shall come to pass. This word hope is not I, uh, the, the world's under the de definition of hope. This is I hope God is going to do what he says he's going to do. No, the hope is there is an expectation of what he said shall come to pass. I've never been pregnant, but I, my wife has. Amen. So I got to watch. She didn't have to hope that she was pregnant. She knew that she was. Because the baby began to grow in her more and more. So the hope went from, I hope I'm pregnant, to I'm expecting. That's, a that's another definition of hope. Expect. Tell somebody I'm expecting. <laughs> I'm expecting glory. I'm expecting the riches and the treasure that my daddy has put in me to begin to come out. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to begin to line up my thinking with what he says about me. No different with Abraham. Abraham, who was the father of faith, whose name was Abram. And when he was 75 years old, he got a promise. It says, you will be a father of nations. He had not one seed in the womb of his wife, Sarah, was, was barren. But when you look in Genesis 15, it says, he agreed, he believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. But then it took... Almost, what, 25 years for that to become to pass. But it did. When Paul quotes it in Rome, Romans uh, chapter 4, he says, 
that against hope, he believed. It says he looked at the deadness of his body. And he looked at the bareness of the womb of his wife. And he increased in faith. Every time my wife and I has hit a place of impossibility, I would quote that scripture in Romans 4. And hope would begin to come alive in my belly. Hey. It says that Abram began to, he says he believed God and was imputed to him for righteousness, right? Imputed means that his bank account was empty. But when he believed what God said, it was filled. Treasure. <laughs> this treasure in you. Uh, which was righteousness. So essentially it means this in the Hebrew. If you don't figure it out, I love word study. So it means that Abram sat in a seat of learning. And he looked at the way God thought about him. And when he compared it to the way that he thought about himself, crooked roads, rough places, low valleys, high places, he began to agree with God and made an exchange. And he turned over his thoughts and received God's thoughts. And treasure was put into his empty bank account. And in his very DNA, what he could not produce began to produce. And his name began to change. He went from Abraham, he went from Abram to Abraham. So Sarah, went from Sarah to Sarah. So in the Hebrew, that means that there was a Hebrew word that was added to Abram's name and Sarah's name. It was a, The Hebrew letter was He, which meant breath. He breathed into Abram, and he became Abraham. Sarah, God breathed into Sarah, she became Sarah. When you put them together, because Abram had to begin to, the promise had to come through Abraham and Sarah. Not Hagar, it had to come through Abraham and Sarah. But when you put Abraham and Sarah together, the hay that was in Sarah and the hay that was in Abraham, when you put those two letters together, <laughs> it is the root word to Yahweh. And it actually means the manifestation of Yahweh. What was in them, they began to manifest. They gave birth to promise because they believe God. And they begin to cause their word, their, their thoughts to begin to come aligned with what he is. So when the spirit and power of, of Elijah comes, it's to bring revelation of how the king is about to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when a king comes, he comes with his army. But he also comes with glory. So the king comes with the culture of the kingdom. It comes with the commonwealth of the kingdom. It comes with the health plan of the kingdom. It comes with the army of the kingdom. Is there sickness in heaven? <laughs> that when the kingdom comes, he brings his health plan. <laughs> the 
kingdom. There's no kingdom without a king. You're going to begin to see the spirit of wisdom and revelation is about to flow through this house. That greater dimensions of the revelation of his glory are about to come. Let me mess with you a bit. God messes with me, so I like to mess with everybody else. Moses was in the realm of God's glory when he received instructions for God to dwell among them. So we talk about the Torah, we talk about the commandments that he received. But Exodus 19 says that prepare himself for two days, and the third day I'll come down in, in, in your presence. It says that. God came down and Moses went up. Then for this series of chapters after that, as he's getting the instructions to build the tabernacle, the, the, the furniture, all those things, do you realize he is in the realm of God's glory receiving these things? But Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 that that glory was fading. And that the glory of the new covenant is greater than that of the old. What does that mean? Exodus 25, 22. He told the, the Lord told Moses to meet him between the wings of the cherubim. The wings of the cherubim is in between. That's the seat of the glory of God. The vision that I seen was these angels with swords that were crossed. And an army was coming. I believe the Lord is creating this place along with your school to be a place of where the glory of God is revealed, not just in demonstration, but in revelation. So that he can have a place to habitate. Not visit. <sighs> hey. Now, from that time that I told you earlier about the, the, the encounter that I had with the fire, what I didn't mention was when I came out of that encounter, the fruit of that was revelation began to come to me in dimensions and ways that I never knew prior to that, to the point where I, I, I didn't dream as much, but revelation began to flow. Ooh. I believe there are schools, <laughs> there are schools of glory. See, there are things you can't get in seminary. But the Lord is shifting men like Andy to begin to go into places of seminary to begin to take what they can't bring in there and begin to create an entire new model. You get theology, but you get it in the realm of His glory. You're not getting it from those who don't begin to walk in it. 
You're not getting it from a place of theory. You're getting it from a place of experience. Jeez. Whew. If this would be a place of Mount Zion. One of the places why the Lord began to, uh, those who don't know, our, our church plant, the Lord gave us a simple name to call it The Gathering. It is according to Hebrews 12, 22. It says, you have not come, now you have come to Mount Zion. The, the, the assembly of a numeral company of angels. with the shakings and the glory of God where everyone was invited up into the presence of God. The comparison before that was you didn't come to Mount Sinai where everyone's at the bottom of the mountain, only Moses went up. He says, you've come to Mount Zion where everyone's invited. Okay? But it was at the top of Mount Sinai where Moses was in the realm of God's glory receiving instruction. Now it shifted we're all invited up to Mount Zion, but it's still, we're being taught in the realm of his glory. Hallelujah. I believe that the Lord wants to begin to make this place a Mount Zion. Where there will be angels. There will be part. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. 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 It's almost like I see angels that are part of the uh, <laughs> the staff. I don't know what this looks like, but I see an angels teaching, and I see people teaching. I see. There's going to be a whole lot of glory in there. <laughs> I just, I just leave it, I'll leave it there right now. <laughs> but there are dimensions of glory and encounters that are going to begin to teach God's people how to pull out what's in them in ways that you would not even think were possible. The reason Elijah has to come is because we can't wrap our brain around it. Does that make sense? See, that's the only reason I was telling of my experience, because my experience was I could I had no grid for what the Lord was trying to show me because I locked him into a certain dimension. Now I don't have a grid anymore after that. It was too scary and painful. And I don't want to go through that anymore. <laughs> The Lord, whatever you want to do, as long as you can show me in Scripture, I'm good. <laughs> That's my only question now. Show me where it's at in the book. At least a at least part of it, at least a door. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's begin to let's stand to our feet. I feel the Lord wants to uh hey, mm, begin to just release an impartation, a key. Even through travail. Hey. Who? Hey. Mm. Mm. She didn't. Da, 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 da. I see a, I see warriors coming. Beside you too. I see them coming beside you to begin to hold up your arms and keep the banner lifted that they will begin to carry your DNA. They'll begin to carry your heart. It's even in many aspects that It's a cave of Adullam, of those that have been discontent and discouraged, particular leaders. 
the discontent and discourage and uh, see particular uh, prophets and uh, those that even move in, in healing, but no one could understand them. But they, they, they found this place has a, has a haven where they can be free, but they can also be healed. Those that did not understand them before get to come to this place to be healed. And they will be like mighty men that will begin to fight through any war just to give you a cup of water. Because they will begin to bring refreshing to you. Ooh. Because the price that you paid to see them healed. And the Lord says, I, the direction that you're going is good. That's me. Keep going. I'll send help. I'll send provision. I'll send rest. But don't allow the present season to deter the immensity of what I've called you to. Because there is an army. There is an army. There is a harvest that is awaiting. He even says that I see both of you begin to carry the, 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 the spirit of David warrior. And it's like even as David began to grab the sword and begin to pull it out of the sheaf of a Goliath, that I see both of you handing a, holding a sword together. He says, I've called you to be giant killers together. And then as you begin to go forth, it's just as David went forth and began to take the very sword of Goliath and begin to cut his head off, that it caused the fear of the army behind them to begin to cause them to chase. That even in your wilderness season, you're coming into a place of promise. Because for 40 days, Goliath began to taunt the people of Israel until David showed up and began to take a smooth stone and begin to take him out. And then he grabbed his sword, pulled it out of the sheath, and began to cut his head off. And when he began to remove that head, the people that were so afraid began to be filled with hope and began to run after the Philistines. And then David began to take the head of Goliath and began to hold it as a trophy. I believe there are heads of principalities in this region that the Lord is about to give you because you are willing to go when everyone else was afraid. And that revelation is about to come that's going to cause you to begin to remove the head. There's mindsets in this region of intimidation. There's mindsets in this region of unbelief that is going to cause you to begin to pull out the sword. And the synergy of what both of you begin to move in is going to begin to remove that head. And it's going to cause a generation of people to begin to move out of fear into boldness. And what you are doing by yourselves is going to cause them to begin to take it and run with it. And then the Lord is going to begin to expand you to continue with the vision. And it's going to begin to grow and grow. Because what you're doing is, the Lord has called you to pioneer in this region. He says there's a forerunner anointing. Oh! Oh! Hey! That is upon you. It's not coming. It's upon you. Hey. Well, so even your scriptures in Hebrews 6. Uh, I believe it's 20. When it says that the forerunner. Would, that he who has tasted. Of the good word and the power of the age to come. That even has the forerunner anointing that's upon you. is because you've tasted of what's to come. And you brought it back into the present. The Lord says, even as you continue to plow, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation is about to pour into this place. And the eyes of those who could not see it are about to see it. And the eyes of those who couldn't grasp it are about to grasp it. And freedom and deliverance is going to come and they are going to run with it. And they are going to run with it. Hey, increase strength, Father. Increase strength. And even leaders have come around that have said, hey, that's good, but it's never going to happen. You're going to, I see them coming to you with a notebook that says, teach us. I see them at your feet that teach us what it is that you're doing, and we repent for not believing and seeing what you said. Oh, hey. 
Oh, oh, hey, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Father, let every crooked way in us, every rough place in us, in us, every valley, every high place, be straight. Oh, so that the glory that's on the inside of us can begin to manifest. Oh. Hallelujah. Woman of God, I see a hmm. there's a baptism of fire. It's about to come upon you, and it's about to release a holy boldness. Hey, and there are streams of glory that I see beginning to flow out of you because words that have locked it in you are going to be burned and consumed in a fire. Some of those words have been what you've said about yourself, and it's been words that others have said about you. The Lord said, believe my report. Believe my report. He said, even signs and wonders are about to pour out of your hands. Hey. I see the oil of the Lord that begins to drip off of you. I even see angels. I see a particular angel that will stand beside you, stand behind you, and begin to whisper things in your, in your right ear. And you'll begin to play them. Hey. And it'll begin to shift things. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor read into the hearts of things that God has prepared for them that love them. As you begin to lay your ear to the breast of the King of Kings, you will begin to hear not only what he says, but what he says about you. Hallelujah. And it will become infectious and contagious. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. King of glory, come in. King of glory, come in. There's an increase of a healing anointing that's going to begin to flow. If you're if you're if you're married and your uh, your spouse is, is is with you right now, um, I want you to grab their hand. If you're married and, and your spouse is actually with you in here today, I want you to grab their hand. I don't, I don't, I don't remember how many times I've, or we've even done like this before, but, uh, I believe there's a, there's, there's a synergy, even as I, I begin to release to your leaders here, that's going to come up on marriages, Ooh. because it's a picture of the bride and the bridegroom, Ooh. And the reason I want to begin to release this for my wife and I because a lot of times we have the same manifestations. And I get electrocuted, so does she. And I vibrate, so does she. Oh. Oh.
And I believe the Lord is going to begin to release not, not just an impartation, but a key that you're going to unlock things that I believe are meant to always be locked within marriage. It's not necessarily something new. It's something that's been hidden through the strategy of the enemy. So in a place where, the, where there are divorce parties that are happening in our culture, I believe the Lord is going to begin to lock realms of glory in marriages that will begin to, to, to be a combatant in a key of, of, of a weapon of mass destruction against the culture. That's kingdom culture. Where the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. Yeah? Father, oh! Let the key of greater unity and expression of your glory begin to happen within couples that becomes infectious and contagious that begins to spread to our children, spread to sons and daughters and the faith that even we begin to raise up. Let there be a new standard of marriage in the glory that will begin to be released. Hey. And there's a plate, there's a, there's, the Holy Spirit is going to begin to bring your hearts into, He's going to release the grace for our, greater transparency. It says that Adam and Eve were naked before each other and they weren't ashamed. There's a grace that the Lord is releasing to cause ex transparency so there doesn't have to be exposure. Transparency so there doesn't have to be exposure. And this isn't always this on a negative aspect. It could be about things in our heart that we're afraid to share with our, our spouses because we're afraid to look vulnerable. Because it's that place of vulnerability and transparency that's going to bring a unity of the of the glory. Let that be released now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. What's your name? Colton? I see a. Uh, You're going to begin to hear the voice of the Lord. There's, there's clarity that's going to begin to come where the voice of the Lord is going to get louder and louder, but it's not because His voice is actually getting louder. It's because you're getting closer. And that's, hey, like you carry glory. And I begin to see just evangelism pouring out of you. And it's not something that you just make happen. It's just you by beginning to speak about the intimacy that you share with the Lord. Mm. And there's an angel being assigned to you that's going to cause a greater expression of healing and deliverance. It's going to begin to pour out of you. And I see a new season of learning. But it's going to be an accelerated place that's directly connected to how much you submit to the process. The more you submit to the process, the greater the Lord is going to begin to release glory upon you. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. There's the, there's, there's the promise. There's the process. Then there's the manifestation. Embrace the process, the Lord says. Some run from it. The Lord says embrace it. Because when you embrace it, it accelerates it, and then you carry a key to begin to release it to others. Most those you encounter, they don't want process. 
They just want the process. But you're going to begin to stand as a leader to begin to through experience to show them how to walk through process with joy. Hallelujah. Because the Lord's going to give you grace for it. Lift your hands. Father, I thank you. Hey. Oh. The new levels of grace. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Wow. <laughs> oh, I don't have a lot to say. That's a switch, right? Wow. Yeah, let's just have a seat.